and I think those most profound moments in Dialogos is precisely when we realize we're not just saying it, we're not even just conveying it, we're actually exemplifying it. When we realize, yeah, that, that, when we realize the moment of participation, that's when I think we get the key to how we are connected to reality. It's deep participation. So I would suggest that the silences that we hear in some sense and dwell in that go, that are so radically silent are precisely those, those moments of progressive levels of aporia where speech yeah. in some sense reaches, mm. sees its own limits and touches it and one falls silent. But it's a silent that's in some sense stereoscopically indwelled with speech is failure, but animating the, the place of speechlessness. Don't take the name of being in vain. Don't speak untruth about being itself is to take God's name in vain. So if you say that reality is fundamentally objects, that we're fundamentally objectifiable and usable and, and where means to an end, what you're doing is you're taking being and you're speaking it vainly. Ah, you're speaking ah, vanity into being, ah, right? Ah, ah. Ah, yes, the state. <laughs> the state. What, I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to, uh, in a moment, ask the two of you just to very briefly introduce yourselves. Um, my mm -hmm. audience already is familiar with both of you, but in case someone new is coming to watch it, just a very quick self-introduction. But before I do that, I just want to ask, is there anything in particular that you had in mind that you would like to happen or see this conversation, something that you're hoping that we'll get to? Uh no, <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. Um, I'm, um, I'm happy with how this has been going. Good. And uh, I'm sort of uh, eager to see where you're going to take us today. Good. And Guy? I enlightenment would be great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Satori? Along the way, I should be yeah. doing other things. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to reach through the screen. I, I like to enlighten people with a slap. I mean, that's the good old <laughs> yeah. Totally. So thank you, Guy and John, for joining us. This is the third part of the series on this great, deep metaphysical dialogue that we've been having around the character of Buber and his relationship to mysticism and dialogue and rationality. The first part was on John's channel. The second part was on Guy's channel. For anyone that has not yet seen those two, I recommend watching those. If you guys would please give us the great honor of introducing yourselves so that those in the audience that don't know yet who you are can know a little. Um, I'm just going to go around the screens. Everyone has a different orientation of the screens, which is quite funny. But for me, Guy is over here on my left. I'm going to ask Guy just to briefly introduce yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. I'm, my name is Guy Sengstock. I think most people would recognize me as one of the co-founders of the practice, the intersubjective practice called Circling. It started in 1998. I've been... Uh, co-founder of the company, the Circling Institute. And I spend most of my time um, training people into facilitating the, the, the group work of circling. And in the last couple of years, I started a YouTube channel. And one of my first people that I talked with was John. And we hit it off and formed something, something that we've come to term Dialogos, which in, incorporates so many things. But I would say brings back the, the musicality and the ancient practice of realizing the logos through dialogue and conversation. So that's what has actually brings me here. So I'm really excited to, to, to be with you. And I, the first two conversations have been pretty mind blowing for me. That's really so awesome. I'm excited for this. Thank you for joining yeah. us. Thank you for joining us. And we've had some of our own conversations together, which were also, I think, mind blowing opportunities. And that brings us to the next person who is sitting with us, who actually I should think he is the person who was responsible for bringing together this trilogue, the person who had the idea and hatched it. So thank you, John, for making that happen. And John, if you could quickly tell us who you are, that would be great. Thanks, Evie. And it's great to be here with both of you. So I'm John Verveke. I'm an associate professor at the University of Toronto in cognitive psychology and cognitive science. I do work on intelligence and consciousness and rationality and wisdom and altered states of consciousness and human transformation. The overarching goal of all of my work is to create a viable and perhaps potentially profound bridge 
between science, particularly cognitive science and spirituality. So I'm very interested in the processes by which people claim to achieve, and I don't mean that facetiously, I take them, I take it to be serious, right? That they, uh, uh, they achieve some kind of self-transcendence that affords them being better fitted, more closely in contact with reality in a way that deserves the name wisdom and potentially uh, in maybe some more rare cases, enlightenment. And I came to know Guy through this joint project of what I call Dialogos, about trying to change how we interact with each other so that we come more and more to exemplify what I see in the platonic dialogues, where the conversation takes on a life of its own and leads people beyond themselves in that kind of self-transcendence. And so that means that there are deep connections between the dialogos and mystical realization. And what we mean by that is a self-transcendence that affords wisdom and brings us closer to reality. That's very much Plato's claim and Plotinus. But the figure that is very interesting for us today, he's a foil for all of these episodes, is Martin Buber, because Martin Buber, uh, it, it, it's hard to label Buber, but one, one label, not exhaustive, is he's the philosopher of dialogos. He's the philosopher of dialogue in the deep sense that I've been talking about here. And yet he seems to be, in some sense, ambiguous towards, or ambivalent perhaps is a better way of putting it, towards mystical realization. He explicitly claims to have turned away from it, yet it still seems to be with throughout his work. So he's a great person for us to explore this relationship uh, between dialogos and mystical realization. And for those of you who have seen it, uh, Zebi and I have had a wonderful series talking about the connections between cognitive science and mysticism. And I've come to really love uh, Zebi and his mind and his presence. And Guy is one of my dearest friends. And so that's why I'm here. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. And thank you for, for kicking off the discussion today. So we've been having this three-way dialogue around Buber. The first one, which we did on John's channel, was looking more from the perspective of Buber and rationality, John representing the rational figure amongst the three. And the second one was on Guy's channel, which is talking about Buber and dialogue. And we brought some Heidegger in there, Guy representing the dialogical for kind of his work encircling. And now we're going to do the third part, which is going to be specifically on Buber and mysticism, mysticism and dialogue. And I'm going to be trying to play that role of the host facilitating the discussion of mysticism, which is a, a fun and exciting and funny thing to do. So what we decided that we would focus on in this conversation is the transition, as John mentioned, that Buber goes in his early career, where he's very much involved in the advocate for mysticism. In much of his early work, he talks about his own experiences, where he becomes one with the nature, with the world around him, a piece of rock that he feels that he's melted his identity into. He does his PhD on two very fantastic Christian mystics, Nicholas of Cusa and Jacob Burma, which really comes to a full in his three addresses on Judaism and in his book called Daniel, Dialogues on Realization. And there is some sort of big shift that happens, as John was saying, to his more dialogical philosophy, to his more mature philosophy, which culminates in his most well-known book, which is I and Thou, which very much is about that dialogue. In the beginning of John's presentation, John broke down a bit about his dialogical philosophy and what the I-thou relationship is, what I-it. We're not going to go through that all again here now. For those that would like to see, please do check out the beginning of John's, but I'm sure it's going to come up again as we discuss. The question then that we're trying to pose here is, firstly, what is it that shifts in Buber's thinking from the mystical to the dialogical? And how is he conceptualizing both of those categories, both the mystical and the dialogical? Um, and how does that fit into the debates around mysticism, both within the Jewish tradition, which I may bring some insight on and within the philosophical tradition. But most importantly, we're not trying to do an explication and exegesis of Buber and Buber's thought, although that will happen along the course. We're trying to see how these ideas can apply to us in our lives, that we can be better people, more thoughtful, more conscientious, more living in dialogue and more realized, and maybe even enlightened as some of us have come to this conversation to, <laughs> to be. So with that little introduction, I would like to turn, we're going to, let's reverse the order now. I'd like to turn to John to tell us a little about the transition that he feels that happens in Buber's thought. What is happening in that, in that really big transition for him? If that's something that you'd like to throw in a word on, John, please. Thanks, Evie. Yeah, I'll try to be as brief as possible so we get some momentum going. Thank you for the beautiful setup. 
so and the the thing about how I see this is um, I I appre- I I both I both appreciate that Uber is putting his finger on something, but I'm also critical that I think he's being perhaps maybe if you'll allow me a metaphor, a little bit too one dimensional about what mystical realization is. So I, I take it that, uh, and, and it's hard to get this because Buber is very indirect about all of this in a certain way, but it seems that he experienced um, mystical realization as in some sense, and I don't wanna say egocentric because that's not mystical experience. So I'm, I'm struggling for another word, but he, I, I, what I want to do is then use the phrase from Plotinus uh, that sort of gets it because it's right. So Plotinus is a famous mystical philosopher of the Neoplatonic tradition, basically considered the father, at least the written father of, of Neoplatonism. And in one of his famous passages, he, he talks about the mystical realization as the flight of the alone, little a, to the alone, or some t- other translations the flight of the one, the one within me to the one without. It's analogous, it's not identical to, but it's analogous to sort of Vedanta realizing that Atman, the ground of the psyche, and Brahman, the ground of reality, are actually non-logically identical in some profound way. Now, although that's not strictly speaking, and it can't be the way I described it, egocentric, there's a sense in which it's nevertheless, I think, for Buber, isolated and limited to his experience or right, um, his transformation. And I think when he realized that there didn't seem to be any direct translation of that into how he was interacting with other human beings, in fact, he reports, I won't go into the details, he reports one sort of pivotal interaction in which he felt he was, he was absent for that person, perhaps in a way that was neglectful, he wasn't fully present with them. And so him, him being called away to the alone, I, I'm surmising here, he doesn't directly say this, but I think he felt that that being called to the alone called him away from other people in a way that he found uh, ultimately not morally, ethically justifiable. And so he wanted to reorient this way. And notice I'm using uh, these two uh, dimensional metaphors, vertical and horizontal. He wanted to fully or, or orient horizontally towards the call from other people and the call to other people and make that the focus because he felt that would ground uh, a life. A moral, moral isn't quite the right word. Um, it's, I want to almost use the biblical word righteousness, right? Which, which is a much more encompassing or the Greek word arete, a kind of excellence with other human beings. Um, and, and he felt, and again, I think with good reason, he felt with good reason that the, the dialogical was the proper place where the deep within me and the deep within you could call to each other. And so, I, I, first of all, I, I, I think he's picked up on a dimension of the mystical realization. I think that Plotinus clearly says that, and I think it's fair for Buber to be concerned about it. And I think it's also right to say that, you know, the dialogical is, I would argue, the proper grounding for right relationship with other people in a very philosophically profound sense. So I, I don't have a criticism of that. What I have a criticism of is, I, I think it's sort of an insufficiency uh, of reading of the Neoplatonic tradition, which is set firmly within the practice of dialectic. And the thing about dialectic is dialectic is both the vertical and the horizontal. That is very, very clear throughout. And so I don't see these as exclusive to each other and posing a choice to us the way Buber does. I see them as deeply affording and integrated with each other. So yeah. while I, I appreciate what Buber is saying, that's my core criticism. Yeah, I, I, I thank you very much. That was a really, that was a really great layout. Um, I want to turn to Guy in a second, but I think before we get to what we may see as the solution to the problematic, which is how the dialogue and the mystical may not be in, in contradiction to one another, I want to focus for a second on, on where, the, or where the conflict is, right? So we can hold yeah. off the solution for a second and, and live in that space where there actually is some sort of conflict, because, because as much as we may be able to reconcile, there still is something which, which clashes there. Um, yes. And I, I think it's very interesting what you were saying in, in terms of, I'm just going to respond to what John was saying, then we're going to turn to Guy to, to share his opening thoughts. The, in, in terms of his realization that he was being pulled away from, from responding to the real things around him, one of the points which I came up just to situate things historically, according at least to the scholarship of Paul Mendes Floor, 
who is one of the leading experts on Bubu, has, has written his intellectual autobiography, his intellectual biography, and, and many other works. He wrote a work on him a few decades ago called From very, very apropos to this conversation, From Mysticism to Dialogue about Buber's interaction with social, with German social thought. Uh, and, and the case that he makes there is that it was actually Buber's initial enthusiasm about the opportunities that World War I may have afforded the, the collective spirit, the Geist of the European nations, that even though that they were in war, they were somehow being united in some sort of great grand struggle. And, and he was heavily criticized, heavily criticized by one of his closest friends, Gustav Lauder, who was a well-known anarchist and, and social thinker, uh, and, and pacifist who was very opposed to the war. And, and at least according to Mendes Flor, Buber's realization that he was so caught up in his rapture about the mystical and about the, this mythic element of the war that he realized that he wasn't paying attention to the real pain and the real suffering and death. That, and, and that's, according at least to, to some scholars, what breaks him away from the mystical towards the dialogical, just to throw in a, a historical element to that. Guy, I would, I would love to hear opening thoughts about what you think about this, the, the break within Buber between his mystical and dialogical and, and what that transition yeah. is for, for him in, in your perception. You know, I've actually been thinking a lot this week about, about that. Because um, it does get kind of confusing, right? What, what exactly he's criticizing it? Because it seems, it, seems, it seems on one hand he's criticizing the mystical dimension, right? But at the same time, he's also criticizing the philosophical abstract dimension, right? And it, and he's critical of both of those, and yet a little bit vague in both of them, right? And, I, and I've been thinking about it from that standpoint for, at first I was thinking about it, what is, like, what is he trying to say from his position? But then this week I started thinking about it, well, what, what made Buber possible? Right, and what does that express in the culture and the intelligibility of what's going on, such that Buber is like an expression of a tension of some kind that's maybe not worked out? And I, I started thinking about is actually I think Buber in some way is responding to a um, a dialectic happening between I'll put it like this. So like in, especially in the East, right? And I think probably, probably in, in, in all, all mystical traditions, there's a lot of talk about the structure of the self, right? Like the, as, a, as a structure, the, the self, the ego, right? There's lots, of, there's lots of talk about how that gets in the way, how you let it go, all that kind of stuff, right? But it wasn't until psychoanalysis, right? that you started to bring attention to the, the substructures of the ego. And what's interesting is that's when, that's, and when they start bringing attention there, what you find out or what psychoanalysis uh, analysis claims to discover is, is that really, if you start to look at the substructures of the ego, that's all out of original relationships with the parents and the family and all, and in fact, how you kind of, heal that, if you will, is through creating dynamics of transference, right? And, and reenacting those relationships and in, 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 in the therapeutic dynamic. And so then you have, then you see this, and I noticed, I noticed in the last number of, like a no, number of years, you see this other dichotomy happening in a number of places between mysticism and like the, the insights of psychoanalysis. And in some sense, that's the human potential movement coming together, right, in that conversation. And Buber is very, very prominent in the human potential movement. And I think he speaks a lot of that concern of like, how do you bring together this kind of understanding of how deep relationships are involved, right, into, the, into having a self, right? You, you know, in, in, human, in the human potential, there's roughly like, well, you got to have a self in order to let go of the self, right? You, get, you can't just bear, you know, spiritual bypassing and all these kinds of terminology. And I have a sense that Buber was an early sensing to that in some way that maybe he didn't quite articulate, but was in response to, of the sense of like, wait a minute, in his life, it seems like these encounters with other people seem to be just absolutely transcendent in some respect, like my experience of an opening to reality in profound ways. Yet nowhere in the in, in, in the mystical 
or or in these abstract systems of 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 the philosophers, am I hearing any account for that? Right. So what is this? this what is this experience I'm having? And it's relationship. And in some sense, it, I, I, I'm wondering if Buber in some some way was saying he was pointing to what what they discovered in psychology um in some sense he's pointing to what about the ontology of that how do you account for that and so so in some ways i think that buber was sensing that tension right and and maybe that's why buber in the in the in the self-help and human potential movement right speaks so loudly there right and, and in some sense this is probably one of the reasons why he's known to us right in in the way that he is because He's speaking, he's an early voice speaking to that. So those are some of my, I've, some of my thoughts this week about that. Could I ask just a clarification question? Because you, mm -hmm. that's interesting. You posed another dichotomy, but it wasn't sort of fully explicated. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and this dichotomy actually comes to the fore, by the way, in the, in the debate between Buber and Young. Like there's a, there's a, mm -hmm. a, a quite mm -hmm. heated debate between the two of them. And so I think you're oh, right wow. Put your finger on that, uh, and I'm wondering, um, since we're spoken, since as you I think well directed us, we should be speaking of it ontologically. It seems to me that there, well, this is a different dichotomy, uh, because uh, the psychodynamic approach is one of emergence up out of the pre egoic. Um, I'm going to use uh, so you know, terms from transpersonal psychology whereas mysticism is often saw as emanation from the transegoic. And there, I mean, and Wilbur, uh, who, uh, you know, I have criticisms of Wilbur, but he pointed out that, you know, we shouldn't confuse the pre-egoic and the transegoic. And part of, what, part of what seems to be going on there is, is a tussle between which one of these, which are we talking about? Are we talking emergence from the pre-egoic? Is that where human salvation is to be found? And we go, what we're going to do is go back down and get it to reemerge, you know, where it was, now there is ego, to quote Freud, right? Or are we going to open ourselves up to the emanation and be drawn beyond ourselves in the transpersonal? So I see that also as a potential. But I like the move you made where you said, you know, the psychodynamic it points to the inherently relational nature of the pre -egoic. I thought that was very, very, very profound. I would say in defense of the mystical, right, the transpersonal, and it's very clearly in Plato that it's inherently relational too. Eros yeah. and the mystical journey are inseparably bound together. And the metaxy, the, the betweenness and the participation are all also inherently uh, profoundly yeah. relational. So yeah. I don't know if Uber w was reading the tradition the way you suggest, maybe he was, but I would like to say, I see that dichotomy, and that's a great insight you brought in about the pre-egoic being inherently relational. Mm -hmm. But I, I would want to say, it seems to me that the uh, emanation has as much relationality in it as the emergence does. That's how yeah. I would want to reply to that. Totally. Yeah, and I think Buber was basically saying, yeah, th but there's not, is there a real account for that in the way that he's experiencing it, right? I think he's in some sense responding in ways maybe he doesn't totally can articulate or understand, but maybe that's some of the tensions that we're feeling. That's some of my, my recent thoughts with that, so thank you. Well, yeah, I, well, I would say that, there, you know, perhaps if you were look, it depends where you're looking in the tradition. If you look later, like people, especially like Eregina, the emergence and the emanation and their inherent biological nature are made the ontological ground of being. Right. 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 <laughs> and so, uh, again, I, I think, uh, again, I, I, I'm doing what Zevi didn't yeah. want me to do. I'm, I'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to say. Right. But there are resources within the mystical yeah. tradition for responding to that. Uh, that right. Way. Yeah. Right. The question of, of where the, the locus of ontology is, where, where the ground of being is, is, is a very important question for Buber. Uh, and, and it's very clear that in his in the later half of his thinking, he situates that in the in-betweenness. That is the, the center, he calls it sometimes. That is the, the locus of ontology. That is, the, that is where the divine is. He has this very cute passage. He says that when, when you hold the hand to the other, it's almost impossible not to feel the divine emerging from between the two of you. Yeah. Um, so he, he, he definitely has a very strong romanticization of both of the 
interpersonal relationship and of the community. He feels like the community is where redemption happens, not in the individual. And what, what seems to be is that he's very much, when, when he's criticizing his earlier mysticism, he's criticizing, it seems, one thing in particular, um, and that has many uh, implications in, in, in all these other areas, in, in the ontological and in the relational, which is that the focus on simply on the experience of the mystic, on the erliebness in the German is what he calls it, as opposed to the, the lived experience, the, the lebens of, of, of the mystic. And which, which is interesting because for those that know Buber's other side of his scholarship, when he comes to discuss mysticism, Buber is very much criticized by scholars of Jewish mysticism, by Gershon Shalom predominantly, for his discussion of Hasidic mysticism as something which is fully lived, which is fully about the way that one goes through the mundane, his, his, his great lines of how the, 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 the mundane acts of the, of the Jewish mystic are those that imbue the divine into them. And that's that's already in his in his second half of his thinking. And you see the transition there, where it's not about just having some sort of personal trans egoic experience which rips one out of their out of their shoes and, and away from the world. But Buber, it seems instead, wants to ground those things. But but it's interesting what you're saying, John, that, that so much of the mystical tradition, and this is a question I had, I wonder if you guys have an answer to this. So much of the mystical tradition seems to give space for the relationship between dialogue and mysticism, for mysticism, which is which is present and which is in lived. And Buber knows that. Buber is, is not someone who is a dil- just a dilettante. He's, he's, he has a PhD and he's writing, he's talking about the livedness of the, of the mystical experience. And I, I'm curious why he, why he, he doesn't work within the tradition to, 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 to talk about more of the in livedness and the relationality of the mystical and instead seems feels the need to run away from it towards this new paradigm of the, of the dialogical. Although there's still a lot of, as as you said earlier, there's still a lot of mystical elements in there. I, I, I wonder if it's, I wonder if there's a correlation between him being single and then being married, where being a <laughs> single person, it's much more easy to this flight of the alone to the alone. And then being married, you're you're there in that bond, in that relationship, which is very central. It's a very central dialogical relationship, hopefully, uh, which which gives me some pause for thought. Being a single person who's very into mysticism, I wonder what's going to happen uh, come the time when I'm no longer single. Will I still hold the same passion for it? But what do you, what why why do you think it is that he doesn't look to the traditions that he himself knows so well, the Jewish, the Christian, and the East, and and Muslim as well, instead of finding these new paradigms, these new, these new ways of discussing the, the ontology of his basic structures of reality. So I, I, I don't have an exhaustive answer to that. I, what, so what I want to do, uh, so I don't want to pretend to be doing that, but I do want to bring in uh, a, a, a psychological proposal from some of the you know, experimental work I've done around mystical experience and some of what you see, which is both the people that undergo it and a lot of the scholarship has focused their attention on the phenomenological aspects of the experience as being the where the essence of the experience is to be found. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so uh, I'm going to use a term, and I do not mean it derogatory, uh, but it's, you know, the uncanniness or the weirdness of these experiences uh, because that seems to be sort of epistemologically problematic, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, but those are also the ones that have so much affect attached to them when the person is undergoing them. So there's a focus on that. Um, and, 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 and there's a sense in which when you focus that way, you are focused into the person's subjectivity in a profound way. Because, all right, because you're, how, what is it like for you to be in this now? And I've been critical of that, uh, and Zebi, you know this. I've been critical of. I'm not. I'm not saying to ignore the phenomenology. What I'm saying is that uh, what I'm criticism, critical of is as people getting fixated on it. Almost, I want to be. I want to be a little bit harsh around that. And right? you can see this in the in, in the scholarly work too. Like even in somebody as as sensitive as James, um, he's really, really William James, really, really focused on this. And it's like, yeah. But, and this is where my background is perhaps biasing me the other way, I'm actually interested in what you might call the cognitive dimension. Uh, and so when you do, we ran an experiment and you take a look at people, you know, first of all, you want to see where, if the mystical experience made an impact on meaning in life. So that's, the, that, that's what you're looking for. And then within that correlation, what was it that is best explains 
what's highly correlated with the meaning in life. Well, it turns out that it's not the phenomenology per se, which has quite a bit of variation in it because of the subjectivity, but something that you can see much more shared, much more uh, objective, which is that there's something in the mystical experience, which is kind of a, a more comprehensive version of what we have when we have an insight experience. When we realize we've misframed or got the relevance or the salience about things wrong, that seems to be doing all the heavy lifting. That seems to be what it is within the mystical experience that actually translates into transformation within meaning in life. And so I'm wondering, I'm, I'm not claiming, I'm, so I'm answering your question with a question, I'm sorry about that, Zeddy, but I'm wondering if, you know, Buber, and, and, and and to be fair to Buber, I'm putting my finger also on a lot of other great scholars. I just did James and others. Did he get caught up in this, the phenomenology, which tends to subjectivize the experience and not focus enough on the functionality, which tends to take you outside of the subjectivity in an important way? Guy? Um, well, I, I think I'm, I keep thinking about it. I'm like, when he talked about the married, <laughs> maybe it's because he was married and these, these kinds of things. I, I, I'm like, oh, maybe this is why my, my wife says, do you want to meditate first before we hang out? <laughs> <laughs> Being exemplified, right? Um, you know, it's, uh, it's funny. And I'm, I'm wondering if this is also what you're pointing to with, because you see, you see in many ways that the, the, the um, when Heidegger's stepping off of Herzler, right, is has a lot to do with Heidegger's criticism of the the standpoint that in in, in some senses is mirrored in like in in metaphysics, right, of this I, notion of the guy, self. Did you say, say Husserl? I didn't get garbled there for a second. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, good. yeah. Where where you know Heidegger's Heidegger's kind of criticism of phenomenology is like. Well, Herzler describes everything from this kind of this, in some sense, this single point standing still and describing everything from an objective point of view and trying to discover what things are. And Heidegger's like, that is just like one minor mode that we hardly spend any of our life in, right? right. He's like, no, it's, it's we're a being in the world. We're already involved in a relation. I, there's no distinction between myself and this relation, but this this when I am myself, it's a relation that's giving all of that, right? And so that's all of this hyphen. So in some sense, it seems, in it, and I think this is where I, I see your work, John, as being a, a deep being, you know, a deep furthering of that, of addressing that oversight, right? That is that is very very there in the West, um, in a, in a lot of ways. So I think we're kind of my sense is that we're as we're exploring this, we're, 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 we're tapping into some deep dichotomies that I think that, that, that in some sense, our conversation is, is, is out of and addressing and responding to. Well, thank you for saying that. I mean, Heidegger uh, is the most, the Heidegger and Marlo Ponti are the single most profound influences on for e-cognitive science. So, uh, yeah. and you know, that comes through Dreyfus and Taylor and Evan Thompson into me. So uh, yeah, I think, you're putting your finger on that. I, I just want to give an, a, an analogous example of what I'm talking about. So here's an, a phenomenon that is interesting because it's, it, it's, I would argue, it's sort of in between on a continuum between insight and mystical experience, the flow experience. And what you see is initially a tremendous interest, right, in the phenomenology of the flow experience. Uh, but no really good, no real good explanation as to why people like why it's optimal, why people keep seeking it out and why people are at their best. And it's only, and I, I, I'm not trying to be self-promotional here. I, I'm one among many, but it's only very recently, like in 2018, where, you know, the work I did with Leo and Arian, what is we, we tried to say, but yeah, but what is the, what are the, what are the cognitive functions and the processes that work in the flow experience that would help to explain why people seek it out. Right. And, and so like, like it, it see, what I'm saying is I see that pattern again. Here's the phenomenology and it's strange and it's wonderful and and i get that but right at some point right you want to say but you want to yeah but why it what if people are just saying false things mm. when they say 
it's the best experience and the best that they do. What if, what if they're just saying, people say false things all the time, right? <laughs> right. And, so, and, and, and that doesn't mean they're lying. Right. And, and so, right. At some point, I would argue you need to question the phenomenology. Um, if you're going to make these experiences, and this goes back to Zevi's point, the, the basis, the foundation and the justification for how you're transforming your life. For me, uh, it's not only that uh, there's a neglect to turn from the phenomenology to the functionality, but also keep relate the two together, right? Yeah. But it's more than neglect. I think it's ultimately detrimental. I think it ultimately undermines the study of the phenomenon. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's. I, I think I think you're right there in in terms of the the, the, the hyper focus on on just the phenomena itself to the exclusion of of either the processes or the ontology or, or the, or the ontonormativity, as you've put it, the, the demands that it makes. Um, I think also the metaphysics is also something which has been excluded in the hyper-focus on the, on the experience. Um, and the hyper-focus on the experience, I think it also is, is partly thanks to how much, how salient it is, but it's also yes. partly, it's also partly, and I'm sure this is familiar to you, but just the audience to the response of Christian, German Christian theologians, to the Enlightenment and to the scientific revolution where they needed a safe haven for religion. Um, and this begins with Kant and taken up by Schleiermacher strongly, uh, where, yeah. where, where the, the bastion of religion gets placed solely in the individual's experience. Um, yeah. Who is it then? Um, Otto, Otto Rank writes The Holy, Das Heilige, and where, where, mm. where, where it really becomes segmented in, in, in experience. And now the move which we need to do, which to, which to say, guys, yeah, sure, the experience is important. It's really great. But let's also talk about the processes. Let's talk about what it affords for us. Let's talk about the way that we live our lives with these experiences, which I think why Buber actually is such an important part of this conversation. I want to, yeah. I want to I bring in one more aspect here of, of the debate around this mystical experience and then hopefully jump off from the books into into experience, into life, as we would like us to do, and talk about how we can begin to bridge these two fields using both of them, bridge the dialogical and all of that, all of its implications, and the mystical with all of her implications. Guy, you have something to add before we do that? Yeah, just so, so I'm just what something I was I was wondering about, Zevi, if if actually in your tradition, right, and it's specifically you know based on a conversation that we our first conversation, I really got the sense, and in some a lot of your videos, this. You, it seems it strikes me as at least um, unique in the way it's emphasized. From what I'm hearing, you is the um, is the mystical the, the 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 mystical aspects of of sound and of 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 even the even even chanting or saying the 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 the, the letters of your alphabet as a way of transcending. I'm wondering if there's a place in your in your tradition where they actually, if that's a meeting point between this, you could say the mystical personal experience, right? Because this is what I'm hearing is 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 basically what we're where this conversation is right now. Is it seems like I'm getting it in my mind. Yeah, there's a there's there's two phenomena going on that 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 we're starting to bring in a relationship. And I'm wondering if your tradition actually does that in in their proclivity towards sound, and especially when I'm thinking about, like, for example, to chant the F, the, 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 just the sounds of the alphabet as a way of transcending. Well, it seems, it seems the alphabet is a function of needing to communicate, right? In this way that, that sound, you know, we dwell in sound in some respects. That's our connection to everything in, in some way, definitely to each other. And I'm wondering um, how the Jewish mysticism looks at this, how they live it. And I'm yeah. wondering if that's one of the ways that they do in this connection between sound and the voice and the alphabet and those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a really fascinating question, and it's it's a huge discussion. Um, there's there's been some interesting work done recently. I'll point people first to some good academic work before launching into my own speculation. Moshe Dell wrote a book recently. Um, I think it's. Jewish mysticism and music, um, where he gets specifically into the mysticism of Abraham Abulafia, a 13th century mystic who he's a leading expert on, and he speaks to, he speaks about that. But just to 
with that reference in mind, so people can find something of, of reputable scholarly value, I'll add my own two cents. Firstly, there is no such thing as Jewish mysticism. There, there are many, many forms of Jewish mysticism and, and iterations of it through history. Um, and I, for example, grew up in one form of Jewish mysticism, which Hasidot, there's Kabbalah earlier, there's, there's Lithuanian mysticism, uh, which is a different strain of, of, of child of different child of Kabbalist mysticism. But even before Kabbalah, you have Hechalot, and there's Shir, there's many, many forms of mysticism. And, and each one of them have a unique relationship with the Hebrew alphabet uh, and with sound, with music. And I'll, I'll just, I'll give you three examples from across the history of Jewish music, uh, of, of Jewish mysticism. One is, and I think the beginning point is that the, the universe itself, the cosmos in itself is somehow verbal, linguistic, and musical, where, where God speaks the world into existence, the logos, ha- there is the sound of existence. Much And much like in, in ancient Greek pre-Socratic mysticism, there's the sense of the music of the, the spheres of the cosmos, that the spheres turn. And if you like listen, you could hear like these, the, 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 the music, the symphony of the turning spheres, this cosmic. I, I always get the sense that, you know, you know there's like, um, like uh, what, uh, who, who, um, who was it Thoreau that wrote Walden? That he yes. like the, the music of the cracking of the ice in the lake as it begins to thaw. Like that's a cosmic kind of symphony going on. And like that's this, that's what I imagine. So for, for the Jewish mystics, it's the words, it's the speech act of creation, which is perpetually being said. So the 10 utterances in Genesis are constantly being said. Those those words says the says the Jewish sources are 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 forever in the firmament, which means they're always being repeated. That's that's first the earliest, which goes on to influence a lot of Jewish thinking. The next best example, and I think we mentioned this last time, is Abraham, Abraham Abulafia. And for him, the, the human process of relating to that divine process of creation by uttering the Hebrew letters and, 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 and connecting the Hebrew letters. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a mix of one's, the mystic's own physiological experience and what happens when anyone does mantras, the mind space you can get yourself into, into a, tra- into a transcendental state, an altered state of consciousness. But it's it's specifically grounded in the vocals, in the linguistic, and the sounds and sounding out of those letters because those letters have cosmic proportion. So you're you're sounding out being, right? You're thinking being, you're speaking being, and and you're partaking in that process of of creation. And the Jewish idea of the of the of the of the Jewish mystic partaking in creation is also a very old idea that that the the mystic co-creates reality with God, which I think is also a very apropos idea that we we are co-creating our realities. We are perceiving and narrativizing. We are the co-creators of our realities with whatever it is that we want to call God, if, if that word means something to us. A third example, which is more relational, um, is my own tradition. And this is away from letters and more towards music directly. One of the, one of the and, and this is just the first three things that came to mind. I'm sure we could sit down and, and go through a whole phenomenology of, of sound and music and, and Jewish mysticism. But one of the very powerful practices of my own tradition is called the nigun, which literally just means a song, but it's a very specific type of melody. Um, sometimes it has words, but more often it's wordless. And it's done in the context of a Hasidic gathering called a farbrengen or a hitva adot in Hebrew. Uh, and, there's, and there's certain, it's, 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 a, it's this most structured, unstructured, formal, informal encounter where people, it's like some could see it as the first like, um, like self-help, group therapy where people get people get together there's there's typically some alcohol which is drunk to to loosen one's nerves and to, to to relax a little into and also there this begins in eastern europe where it's freezing cold outside so you begin with a, a bit of schnapps a bit of alcohol um, and then besides for for talk and for thought and for words the central repeating theme that that breaks are taken for doing during this and for bringing could be one hour could be nine hours um is to sing a nigan and it's a wordless melody and and there's a sense of of communion around that song that that the melody can be very complex and there's hundreds of them and 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 someone will just begin one the one that comes to one it it just comes out of the person and everyone will slowly begin to hum along and join them in that song and in that singing together there's something very profound that happens which is that when we're speaking we each have to take turns to speak particularly over zoom where we can we can cut each other off in awkward ways so we have to like make sure that guy can speak and john can speak and somebody can speak but if we were singing in nigan we could all just close our eyes and we can all just sing together and we can melt into that shared experience of singing in unison and i wonder if you've done anything like that in, in circling or in in your dialogical practices where where where, where melody is used to, to to bring people together because i'll tell you what in a, in, a, in in this context um, and I've been doing this since I was, you know, a young teenager. It is one of the most powerful experiences and it's an experience which allows one to really open up and really be present in, in that collective space. 
uh, and for Buber, who's who's both a scholar of, of Hasidic mysticism and someone very interested in the in betweenness that's created, uh, I don't remember any direct any direct quotes or thoughts that he has about the Hasidic melody, the nigun itself. But it's something worth looking up because um, I'm sure he has. I'm sure he's he's waxed poetic about it. So that's a, a brief three points in Jewish history about m- melody and and sound in relation to uh, those different uh, axes. I've done group chanting that has that yeah. effect very hmm. much. Uh, and then I, there's, there's very much a, a musicality when you're getting into dialectic and to be a logos. Um, that's, and so the metaphor we frequently use is jazz. Hmm. Uh, you're doing something like jazz and you're picking up on the rhythm and the, 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 <coughs> the lyricism of what you're saying um, the way it exemplifies what you're saying is as important as sort of the conceptual content. But you were about to make another point yes. before. Yes. That, and I, yes. 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 So I, I think what we've just done is good. I want to come back to the musicality of intelligibility to use yeah. Russo's notion, his excellent book, Bearing Witness to Epiphany, um, because it tries to bring these two, that book tries to bring these two together, bearing mm-hmm. witness to epiphany. Uh, but go ahead. Yeah, what I wanted to launch into, um, and, and, I, and I think this might be a fruitful um, segue into, into a more reconciliatory aspect of, of this dialogue, is the, there's a long-standing debate uh, within the world of mysticism, and particularly when it comes to Jewish mysticism, about what is the nature of the mystical experience. Um, is it one in which the mystic, uh, he or she, feels like they have become one, unified, undifferentiated, um, totally united, absorbed into the whatever it is that they're they're calling it god nature the universe being whatever it is are they, is it, are they becoming one with that thing um which is what buber seems to be speaking about in his early phase which thing which he seems to be um scared of and apprehensive of later um he's concerned of a of a, of a deep loneliness and solipsism when one unites with the all there's still all that's left is the one uh and that can be very lonely in it in like the most terrifying cosmic way um or is is the ultimate experience of the mystic. And particularly this debate is very heavy when it comes to Jewish mysticism. The debate is most known between Gershon Shalom and Idel. Um, I think it's interesting that, that both of the debates, the b- debate between Shalom and Buber and, and Shalom and Idel, both kind of afford each other in ways that may have not been pr- aware while those things were happening, where Shalom says that in Jewish mysticism, all we have from the literature is that the mystic comes and is, and is in the presence of the divine of God, is, is, communing with God is, is in, and, and that's something which happens very early in Jewish mysticism. He says that the Jewish mystic never becomes one with God, never becomes God, God's self, always remains, there's always separation, there's always distance, no matter how close they get, there's always a, a, a substance uh, otherness between them. There's a, there's a substance dualism that, that, that separates the, the creator and the created. And, and this is something which Shalom makes quite extensively throughout his, throughout his years. Um, and, and this debate of, of, of presence versus unity or absorption versus communion um, is, is, a very, is a very interesting one. There's later scholarship in, in Jewish mysticism has kind of overturned Shalom scholarship and says, no, there really is a strong sense of, of unity. And in my own feeling, I mean, I'm, I'm very much for unity. That's, I mean, I named the Project Seekers of Unity. Like, I really yeah. think that, I really think that the, the experience and the ethic is about really seeing how it's all one, Atman is Brahman, like it's all, there is no differentiation. But reading now Buber again and, and reading his, his his apprehension towards describing the experience that way and 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 seeing what it does for him personally in his own life and how it makes him re- misreact to the war where he should have retrospectively in his own opinion been opposed to it and he says that he had to he had to um, suffer and overcome his own nationalism um to to his later form of thinking perhaps the model of of the mystical as the encounter and not as the union Maybe that there's if we if we play with that language and we play with that with that ontology, there could be something more fruitful coming out from from the experience. And the reason I say this is not just to have fun and to and to get into the the, the games of you know the 19th century debates about mysticism. But I think that what we now know about mysticism, thanks to the great work by people like Stephen um, Stephen Katz, is the relationship between mysticism and interpretation or experience interpretation. And I think it's upon us, people who are discussing mysticism. Um, at a high level to to provide the to provide I don't know if the correct maybe a bit too much hubris but better ways that people that are having this experience 
which the numbers have put, I've seen them put at one in five, one in three. People are having this experience. I think it's upon us to provide the framework to interpret these in the most fruitful ways for individuals and for humanity at large. So I, I want to make a proposal that I have been making um, that um, the language of participation properly understood within the Platonic tradition is the language that exactly bridges between those and tries to get beneath um, the absorption and the relating, the communing. Um, and, and, and the thing that Plato really, uh, like, and, Sh and Sandy makes this clear in his book on dialectic within the Parmenides, the thing that Plato struggles with is you don't understand participation as long as you think that things are the ultimately all the ultimate bench stones of reality. So that what so as long as you're committed to nominalism in in some fashion that what really ultimately is are individual things, bound, spatially temporally bounded things, and everything else is in some sense added on to them or illusory about them, right? Then you don't get what Plato's talking about because Plato's trying to get you to see right, that, right, he's trying to break you out of that way of thinking when, and so, and, and one of the criticisms that's going on a lot of scholarship right now is people's, uh, the, the, the previous scholarship about the theory of the forms w was missing this central move, this apparatic move that Plato's trying to break us out of a certain way of thinking in order to get us to see, right, that the forms, which are, again, right, which are much better understood as, you know, instances not objects right instances of participation um that once we make that we like so this is what i think is what we there, we can't grasp this without going through a, a, an essential kind of transformation a fundamental transformation of our cognition and consciousness so it's it's a truth that is only disclosed in transformation and then as you make that transformation you move to seeing right that uh, well, that participation is something that captures in some ways I, I'm, uh, uh, both unity and relation. Um, so, like, look, like, if you, what is, and, and I don't want to get into too much Platonic scholarship, but the, uh, sort of a, a way of putting it briefly, uh, so it's helpful to get it into it, but it's overly simplistic, is uh, sort of the idea that, well, well that, Right. Intelligibility is what's most real, and intelligibility is both inherently relational and inherently integrated. If you try to break it up into oneness, you lose intelligibility. And if you try and break it up into just the things that are related, you lose intelligibility. The, the intelligibility is something that everything is participating in, right? They're not, you're not absorbed into some um, homo homogeneous. But you're also, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm having to gesture yes. because there's a lot in here. So is that, would you say, the, I just noticed the places where you're like, uh, it, it, <laughs> in the, these, these kind of places where you kind of stop and it, it's not quite satisfying, it, it doesn't quite do it. Is that exemplifying the very thing that you're, try, that you're getting at with participation? Right? Yeah, it is. So think about, think, about, think about how my speech is participating in what whatever intelligibility I'm I, I'm realizing, and I and my speech is participating in it. Now, is my speech separate from it? That doesn't make any sense, right? Because then the speech would not possess any intelligibility, and it would not disclose what my, my what the intelligibility is it's forming, right? Is it merely one with it? No, that's why I'm struggling with speaking, right? It participates. It's a relationship of participation. Is it and, fair and to say? Why, and that's is, why, is, by, is, by is the it, way, but by the way, before you, just one more thing. That's by the way why I think speech and, and we, we, our, our previous little. Uh, just, that's why speech is such an important enacted thing because in speech we enact the that. participation of intelligibility. Right. Right. Sorry, I just wanted right. to finish. I interrupted you guys. Sorry. Totally. And I'm wondering if this. I'm wondering, John. And Zeb, if this, this actually brings together the thing about sound, right? It, the, that that it, in, in many ways, speech 
and and this is really this is another aspect to it because I wonder, you know, we all know about like the alphabetic language, right? When it was written down, that that just changed consciousness itself. Once you un yeah, yeah, you yeah. unlinked this participatory sound, that's probably like if you try to think about before written language, what what was language to them, right? Without it being in some sense being able to stand alone and somewhat separate from them, like. It, it just changed that afforded so much, but it also, cr in some sense, created a lot of these dichotomies, right? In which we're trying to overcome in some way. So, it's, as much as it made possible, it also created a lot of, a lot of like strange things to work out that we're doing. But I'm wondering if, yes. Well, because, and this is Greg's point, Greg Enriquez, right? The justification hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Propositional speech gives us access to what's going on in people's minds what, the way nothing else does. So we are especially vulnerable in speech. And so it, 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 that vulnerability to each it's other, intimacy. right? Right. Yes. That vulnerability to each other also yeah, is, yes. it participates oh. in the fact that speech, like when we say it's showing you what's in my mind and we just leave it there. And that is a bloody useless containment metaphor. And one of the things that Sandy and other people make is we keep trying to understand participation as one thing being contained in another thing. Mm. And that's exactly what he's trying to, Plato is trying to break us out of thinking. Where is E equals MC squared? Where is it? What does it make sense? Oh, it's there. It makes no sense. You can't point to it, but it is a fundamental reality. And all of reality participates in E equals MC squared. I notice I can only disclose it with speech. <laughs> I, 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 can't, I can't, I can't, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can, look, E equals MC. Like there's nothing I can do other than speech to reveal that profound participation. But of course the speech is not identical, right? And I think those most profound moments in Dialogos is precisely when we realize we're not just saying it, we're not even just conveying it. We're actually exemplifying mm -hmm. it. When we realize... I was just going to say. Yeah, that, that. When we realize the moment of participation, that's when I think we get the key to how we are connected to reality. It's yeah. deep participation. At least that's what I'm proposing, Zevi, to your question. Yeah, I, I, I want to play to, to draw that out, John. I want to play devil's advocate a little. Of course. Um, and, 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 counter, and counter with the the great nemesis of speech which has a lot of place in mysticism and realization which is silence um mm -hmm. but before that i want to i just want to say that I, mm -hmm. i'm i'm so with this that the 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 anti the 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 focus on participation and on i think and a word which may be added here directly is process which i think is yeah. very important for you and for white heading metaphysics which i think yes. makes yeah. so much sense of reality and of mysticism um i think i think process and and yeah. participation are two yeah. keys to, to to be putting yeah. in that pod together? Yes, um, very much. I another another thing as an aside before getting to 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 the other to to silence is I am dying to see you and Jorge Ferreira in conversation because Jorge Ferreira is a great scholar of mysticism as far as I'm concerned, uh, and he's yeah. placed his full weight behind a participatory um, yeah. apology and interpretation of mysticism. We, we so had I, a dialogue set up, and then timing, and it just sort of fell through the cracks. I'm gonna maybe try and get it going again. I will put down my own money to 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 see that happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. that's, that that that's that's one thing. The the other thing I want to say is that I th this focus on intelligibility and on language and on alphabet, which plays such a huge role for for humanity and for mysticism and for philosophy, um, which is so important. I'm not trying to take any of that away, oh, but no, of it, but it seems like there is. Um, to use maybe a cheeky term, there is something of a, a logocentrism here. And it's not allowing us also to, to hold in participation with that, the space for the non-intelligible. The mystics constantly speak about that which is the realm, the, 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 the roof of intelligibility. And then that is simply that is beyond intelligibility. Mm -hmm. that, that cannot be reached. That cannot be, I mean, ineffability is also is, is part of that, where there is that which yep. cannot be put into language. So the, there, there's the realm of, of language. But beyond that, there's the realm of silence. And for me personally, in my own life experience, the moments of, of greatest intimacy and greatest union and communion and, and participation 
did not happen when words were being exchanged. It was simply, ah. it was simply in, in, in the silent presence of, of being with another person or being with other people. Um, and I'm curious to know what, what, what you think about that as, as a foil to, to language. Yeah, well, the, I do. I do. So the, I, I think the, uh, uh, the invocation of Derrida might be uh, something we can come back to with logocentrism. Uh, but uh, I would say, uh, although I was trying to indicate uh, speech as a place where we feel that radical participation, I think there is that which transcends speech in which we get the, the, where the, the participation in intelligibility moves into, you know, realization of intelligibility, where the participation is being fully exemplified, right? And that's the moment of insight. And that's, yeah. again, where I think, right? And, and the thing about insight, yeah. and, and I can say this, you know, with, with empirical backing, insight is properly an ineffable event. And it, in fact, you have to, in fact, it's more than just a lack of, you have to shut off propositional processing in order to gain access to the self-organizing emergence that's at the core of insight. And insight is this birth of intelligibility and you see it coming through you and it points to, right? It points to some inexhaustible source. So, and, and you see again in the neo Neoplatonic tradition that you transcend the participation in proposition, dianoia into noesis, right? Which yeah. is where you're now moving. Yeah. And noesis is, noticing insight that 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 and then that points you to well what what makes possible you know that the moment of the the, the moments of insight and that's yeah. the one and, and so and that's that, how i would reply go ahead and, the, and i would i would suggest that the silences that we hear in some sense and dwell in that go that are so radically silent right are precisely those those moments of progressive levels of aporia where speech yeah. in some sense reaches mm. sees its own limits and touches it and one falls silent but it's a silent that's in some sense stereoscopically indwelled with its own speech's failure but re but animating the the place of speechlessness and this is where in in recent scholarship i noticed with the people are starting to recognize again in the Platonic dialogues, this is the point where Socrates, like all of a sudden, like starts being enacting the one yes, when yeah, you can yeah. no longer say it. And he's even he's even talking about how stupid he is that he can't he doesn't know what it's it's doing, but he's doing it in a, such a way that it's actually he's being the yeah. one that's beyond speech, right? That enactment, right? So I think because there's also there's also the kind of speech, there's also the kind of silence of like when you're, you know, when somebody's mad at you and they're withdrawn and then, you know, the paint, you feel like the paint's like peeling off the wall because of the silent <laughs> shoulder, right? There's different, there's not just silence, there's different kinds of silences that in some sense are pregnated. And I would say that Dialogos, in some regards, this is, I don't think there would be Dialogos or you would at least as an experience of it, unless in some sense it's it's that very reach, right? That that in some sense we're through speech, we are we're 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 speak we're it's it's enacting and leading to what is beyond speech, right? In some sense, right? So I think that there's lots of there's lots of ways where this kind of comes together and presupposes the other and points to the other. And as exemplified, I think even in this dialogue where you're talking, you know, John, when you went like, look, I can't, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Well, but, th but that's exactly it. I mean, so one of the things, I mean, speaking again, functionally, not phenomenologically, I think what's going on in Dialogos is, right, so, is a shared flow state where we, 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 we've got a musicality where we're, we're resonating with each other and, and, and provoking more and more insight in each mm. other. And when you get an insight cascade, that's the flow state, and then and the flow state, right, starts to um, be something above and beyond. For me, that's the that's the that's the first sense of the logos. It like that flow state of intelligibility that is something beyond everything we're saying, and it's taking on a life of its own. It's weaving us together. But but that that's what I'm trying to get at. That there's something in the like I'm trying to take the moment of insight to be something that we seek in speech because of the way speech participates in the process of particip 
right, in the process of intelligibility, but that in Dialogos, it leads us to the operatic moment where we get insight. And then, and then the thing I want to say to you in insight, right, are, are, is that a relational event or is it a unification event? And, and it's like, it's both and neither. Like if you try and reduce it to, I, I just get absorbed in the problem. No, you, that's just being fixated on the problem. Oh, well, I just come into a new relationship. That's not right either, right? There's a, there, there's a sense of yeah. like insight. I'm going into it in some ways. That's why we use these, I, and I don't mean to be Freudian, but we use these penetrative metaphors for what happens in insight, right? And again, they're, they're, they're okay as metaphors, but they're metaphors of the containment of one thing and another. And therefore they ultimately, ultimately mislead us by misframing the phenomenal the phenomena process of participation. So I, I get the metaphors, but at, like you want to state the metaphors and then you want to break the metaphors. I, I want to ask, I want to ask what this phenomena of participation is, because I think it's something which we're not used to thinking of in, in our current intellectual, uh, in our current Weltanschauung, in the current climates that we live in. Yeah. But I just want to, I wanted, I wanted to add, I think what you guys were saying before about the, the interplay and the dance between music and science is so so rich and beautiful. And two thoughts came to mind <laughs> from, from Jewish mysticism, which is one of them is speaking about the relationship of the letters. We're talking about alphabet. So, so letters are, are made when we have a black letter on a white background is typically how it's done. Yeah, and yeah. The, in the Torah scroll, that's how it's done. And, and the Kabbalists describe it as a black fire on a white fire. There's like these, the, the letters are dancing, but there's, there's, there's one very enigmatic text which speaks about the, the there's a mythological number associated with the number of the text of the Torah, which which if you do an actual word count, it doesn't turn up to be. But for some reason, it's been said that there are six hundred thousand, and there's a good reason because it's related to the number of root souls, whatever it is. But it said there there are six hundred and six hundred thousand letters in the scroll. Uh, it's a, a, a mythological number, not not a scientific number. But and then the there's a talk of the of the 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 messianic Torah, the Torah Chadasha, the new Torah, the the Torah of the the eschatological Torah, the messianic Torah, um, which is the six hundred thousand and one. It's the it's one more, and the, and the one more is the white parchment which was there underlying all of the black letters the whole time. It's the silence ah. which allows for all of those it. letters to to emerge, and that's 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 the great letter. That's like the the skin which contains all of all of the organs, and that's. Which, which, which you think about speech, right? If there was no science in speech, we could have, there would be no intelligible sentences. Uh, whether, 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 if there, was, if there, there has to be the white space between our words for there to be. So silence and speech are never separate. They are perhaps a great demonstration of a participation, right? The way that they, they, they participate in, with each other when they're happening. And the other one is, and, and that's, that's a participation which is, we can think of at least verbally as, stochastic or visually as surrounding, but there's another participation where they actually indwell each other in a very rich way. And what comes to mind is the described experience. There's a lot of work now in the phenomenology of the, the prophets um, of the Bible. There's this really one great moment with this one incredible theophany where, uh, which I'm sure people know, where um, the prophet Elijah goes to the forest and he's trying to get, he goes to the desert, sorry. And he's trying to get a revelation from God. He's running away from- Yeah, from, yeah, from, yeah, from yeah. And, and, and Yuzeva. Um, and he, he, all of these like tremendous things happen. There's like a whirlwind and there's a tornado and there's there's a fire. And, and in each one that happens, it says like God was not there in the whirlwind. God was not there in the fire. God was not there in the earthquake. And then finally, after all of these, like what we typically associate perhaps with the mystical, with this, like the numinous, tremendous, uh, mysterious, like this, yeah. these, these shattering experiences, but, but God was not present anywhere. Then he finally hears, he hears the cold mama daka. He hears the small, still silent voice, which is this commingling of silence and voice together. Yeah. It's silent, yeah. but it's a voice. It's a voice, but it's silent. And, and it's it's in that silent voice where he hears the divine. And I think about that with the way that we approach people in our lives. Sometimes we we, we come and we we can be overbearing. We could be like, we could be the raging fire or the or the tornado or the earthquake. Yeah, and we yeah. think that and we think that we're coming with a position of of power to help them, to shake them. But sometimes all people need is a small, still silent voice, a word of encouragement, a word of care, a word of of love. Which can be very still and very silent. It can be, it's that it's that point where speech and silence meet each other in the experience, which which and that is that for him is where God is. I was just as a, as I was listening to you, I was imagining. I, I started to imagine that um, that one 
And in some sense, like, oh yeah, I'm listening. And in some sense that there's a, I'm, I was wondering about if I'm the, in that moment, I'm that one, that, that one extra letter, <laughs> right. That, that, that in some sense, this is the, this is the union part of speech. And in some sense, the listening component that draws yes. out, right. And affords the speech. Right. And in some sense, I'm wondering if that's, if that's the way in, in dialogue, in some, in some sense, it's that the silence manifests itself is between, but also as you're listening right now, as you guys are listening right now, are that silence in some sense, the local representation of that skin or that, what did you call it underneath the, the, the scroll? I love that idea. The I, love scroll. The, I love the idea that we become each other's scrolls as we listen to each other and we allow the other person to put their words out for us. And we are the place we are the scroll that becomes the receptacle for those ideas. That is such a beautiful, that's such a beautiful imagery. Thank you. Thank you for that. Guy, guy's great at that. <laughs> I, 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 can I bring in a more, uh, I don't know, mundane example uh, from Gilbert Ryle to try it because the, the still small voice, uh, the still small silent voice is also, you know, I hear, I've heard that, I, you know, I, I, that's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. I've read so many different translations. And it still small voice, sheer silence. And I get that the Hebrew somehow is connoting all of these at the same time. And the English just can't, doesn't have a word that brings them all together. But let me, let me, let me uh, say like something that it makes me think of. And, and Gilbert Ryle gives this very, and, and he writes this really important passage. Uh, and Gilbert Ryle is not really called to the mystical, but anyways, uh, uh, in the concept of like, not in the concept of mind, but another essay. And it's and he and he really reflects on it very very deeply. He says, "Has this ever happened to you?" And of course it has. That's why I use it. You're driving along and you notice that you're up, you're almost out of gas. And he says, "But you don't actually have you don't have anything like even the smallest whispering voice in your head that says, oh, well, by the way, you're out of gas.' Somehow, and this is no noesis noticing. Somehow, I see the gauge. I see the needle." And I realize that I'm almost out of gas, but there has been no speech. But but it seems so close to speech. But you're not like when I when I go into the kitchen and I notice that the lights are on. I don't in any way say to myself, "The lights are on." I'm walking into the kitchen. I but I'm noticing that I'm doing that. I'm trying. Right. So I, I'm not trying to remove us from the loft behind us, but I'm trying to get like the for me, yeah. like for me. I see Elijah as do, having some sort of profound noticing is happening, right? So some sort of profound, because he, he does this, right? He, he, he cloaks his face. He, so, he, he, so he realizes something and he can't bear the awareness of it and he turns away. And, and so, um, at least in the translations I've read, I don't presume, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm worried about, uh, you know, inaccurate. Uh, 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 translation, but you know, I, I've been reading that passage as a right kid, and that's that uh, I noticed that dramatic moment, right? He like, he, mm -hmm. he, and so, like, I'm trying, I'm trying to get at that, that, that silence, right? The, the there's the he calls them wordless thoughts, uh, Ryle, right? There's that, and that's what Noesis originally meant. It meant that noticing, that noticing that makes mm -hmm. statements possible but is no statement. That noticing is what would allow me to say, I need gas, or, oh, I'm almost out of gas. But it is not that yeah, statement. It's, it's, a, it's this, that, right? It's, and, and, and so I, I'm, trying to, I'm, I'm trying to show how insight is, it, it, there's these like micro insights when you notice that the lights are on in the kitchen or you notice that the floor needs vacuuming. And you're not saying anything to yourself. You're not imagining yourself vacuuming the room. You're not imaging. You're not speaking. And yet you're doing this still small voice that the speaking that isn't yeah. the speaking. And, and that's what I'm trying to point to, uh, right? Uh, uh, and that's that's the kind of thought you need to deeply remember if we're going to try and talk about participation. Yeah. It's, you are participating yeah. in a way in which an aspect of reality is now disclosing itself to you. Hmm. Dude, I, the onto, yeah, this is this is this is great. 
I, I like the idea that it's that it's it, it it both pulls you to it to and and also there's a sense that there's the, the fear from it that we, we pull yeah, away yeah, from yeah, it while yeah. it pulls us to us. Uh, and I think I think the parallel image, uh, which according actually according to to later Jewish tradition happens at the same place. Um, it happens the, the 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 place where Ezekiel, sorry, where where Elijah hears this called Mamadaka is the same is at Chorev, is at Sinai, the same place where Moses uh, and the, the revelation at Sinai happens, but also the same place where Moses first encounters the burning bush, which seems to have oh. a very strong relationship yeah. Yeah. to, to yeah. this later yeah. Yeah. event with, with Elijah. Yeah. And over there, yeah. there's there's this sense of, of fascination. It's Moses says, a sura nava eris amara zois. Let me let me move away from where I am to come close to this thing and to see it. And and put with that is this fear. He's afraid to approach it. It's and and there, there's a sense where he has to, you know, there's there's the, the, the sacredness of the ground. He must remove his shoes before he approaches it. The sense that yeah. that, the, that the sacred, the numinous calls us to it at the same time while we're pushed away from it. And that that in itself is also another directional. Um, yeah. relationality or participation with it, where we're pulled to 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 relate to it, and also pushed away from it. Uh, I think also great moments in life, right, where, where, when we when we feel like something is is the is the next important step that we need to take um, to to take to take yeah. a specific job or to move into a relationship or to make a geographical move. We're pulled towards that thing, but we're also there's also hesitation. There's the butterflies that keep us from it. There's that sense of I, I, I'm curious to know more. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to pick up on that because here's an initial proposal about starting to get into what I would, what participation is. Please. Right. So notice that you're, you're, you're speaking of, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a conformity, but conformity is not absorption, yet it, it, it's a kind of identity. And, and, and so think about participation as that which affords conformity while preventing it from being complete identification. So, right, for Plato, you know, any act, anything, any object that I find beauty, uh, I find beautiful, it conforms to what beauty ultimately is. But it also, in Plato, the problem with sensible things is anything that I find beautiful, you might find ugly. They're unstable. They, 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 they both are and are not all the time. And so I, I can't actually come into knowledge of them where knowledge means I can't conform to them. So whatever I can conform to, to that, whatever, whatever reality its beauty has, I'm conforming to it when I know it, but it, the object is also conforming to that beauty. It's, but it's not identical to beauty because if it was identical, no one could ever say, but that's not beautiful. And they can. So the thing participates in beauty, and I also can participate in its beauty because we both part are participating in beauty. It's it's that it's the affordance of conformity, both of the knower and the known, and of the thing and whatever reality it happens to instantiate, whatever being it has within its ongoing becoming. Would you say that's the same way that we can form in dialogue, where where where? As the words come out, we wrap around them. Like I said, we become the scroll which conforms around those words. But I don't become that idea. I don't. I don't become you in that yeah. dialogue. But we. But we hold that space to conform each other in the dialogue. Guy, is that what you feel? Yes. Yeah, so so the, this is one of the things that struck me. That that you really got me thinking, John. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you're right. How how do I have that experience if I'm not thinking about it and I'm like not concerned about it? And you just look down. And then it literally addresses you, right? You're not, it's like, it, it's like, you're not, I think the mystery there, it seems is something about like, I wasn't listening for, I wasn't expecting it yet. It spoke to me hmm. like, and I, I, I've often thought about this. Is this the same thing about where, and it's funny, I think I've used this, I use this metaphor a lot in teaching actually in the process of deep teaching circling, right? Skills is that it's something like, I use this metaphor and I'm wondering if it's the same thing, where if you're in a, if you're in a, like a big festival or something, right? Where it's really loud yet way faintly, somebody's sound, you hear the sound of your own name. It's as if everything stops, all the animals hush. And you're like, like, 
like as if you were listening for it constantly in some way that you didn't know there was a special ear right that was like always listening for the sound of your own mm. your own name right just everything hushes and i've often talked about that and i've and it's funny that I, where i use this analogy a lot is actually in learning kind of deep subtler skills right in um in places where it's like something about the optimal grip right where you start to be able to without looking for it things are able to speak to you and you're noticing that before a certain level of development you couldn't hear those hmm. but it's almost like you in some sense you there's some part it's as if some part of you a, an ear was assigned to just being alert for that in some in some sense because the experience is as if you were listening the whole time for the sound of your own voice right and i'm wondering it's so, and I don't, I don't know if it's the right analogy, but it, it does seem like, oh yeah, the, the thing speaks to me. <laughs> That's how I know to notice it, right? Well, well, I mean, for me, I mean, and that goes into Treisman and all the stuff about the cocktail party phenomenon, the cocktail party effect. This is all, right, uh, uh, models of attention. And it's how, I mean, and notice we're falling again into linguistic metaphor to talk about something that isn't linguistic, although the closest thing we have yeah. to it is language for some reason. Yeah. And for me, this is again, relevance realization. It's like, there's this process going on and it makes representation possible, but it's not running in representation, speaking as a cognitive mm -hmm. scientist. But mm -hmm. I want to, I want to, I, I, and I think that's what you're, you're, you're talking, I want to go back to what uh, Debbie asked you. Mm -hmm. and, and I think what you're trying to point to is, like, you know, where uh, your beautiful metaphor, we become the scrolls to each other. Because I think that's right. <laughs> uh, I, and I'm trying to get at what's going on there because, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to see what's the sameness. Because the thing about uh, uh, participation, it's not categorical identity, it, it, right? Yeah. It's not how all cars are belong to the category. That's the, 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 you know, we've got sort of a, risk, a, a misreading of Aristotle's reading of Plato that sort of let, that's not participation. That's not quite the right way of thinking about it, right? Here's a different way of thinking about it, okay? And it goes towards, I think what you're saying about the optimal mm -hmm. grip and the, and, and, and the scroll, let me try. So, uh, you know, Husserl and the Marlo-Ponti Marlo talk about this phenomena, right? So, I'm looking at the object and I can keep noticing both perceptually and conceptually different aspects of it. But no aspect is the object. Yeah. No aspect is no, no, is, oh, that's it. That's the complete object, right? In fact, that's why we have to seek optimal grip. The, the, the no aspect is complete. And, 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 and the number of aspects is inexhaustible. And yet it's not a chaotic. It's not a chaotic inexhaustibleness. There is somehow a, a, a mm -hmm. oneness running mm -hmm. through it that each aspect participates in, but is, right? So the aspects participate and, 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 mm -hmm. and, and, and the object isn't somehow separable out here in abstract, what people used to call platonic space mistakenly, right? That's mm -hmm. where the object is, right? It, no, it's that the, 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 all of the aspects participate in it and, and, and afford our noticing of it and, and, our, and we can ongoingly notice it, right? And it's the same thing like what, what I think a self is. People present, continually present new aspects of them that we notice. And this is, the, this is where I'm trying to get to the scroll metaphor. But we sense because we have so much more access to people than we do to this, right? Right, we we sense that there is a oneness. There's something that's ordered to this that makes it an on. None of the aspects break off from each other. We, oh, like like you do in certain horrible states of hallucination. Mm -hmm. Right, Oliver Sacks talks about that machinery. Actually, some people, you know, the man who mistook his wife for a hat. That machinery gets broken, and those aspects break apart from each other, and 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 you lose reality. Right now, here's what mm -hmm. I want to say. Take all of that, which is still about a thing, and then transfer it to things, to transfer it to entities that aren't things. Again, like E equals MC squared. Everything is an aspect 
of E equals MC squared, but no, no event, process, observation fully discloses it, but neither is it separate from it. And it's not like things mm. are in E equals MC squared. In fact, Plotinus goes on to argue, no, no, there's a sense in which these principles are fully present because they don't have parts because they're not things. And that's mm. what I'm trying to get at what participation is and why human beings are such a great bridge because human mm. beings are like things, but we also know, we deeply know, and that's what morality points us to, people are not ultimately things, right? They, they're, they're selfness. Their oneness, their identity, all these languages that doesn't quite work points to something about them, right? That's really real, that isn't caught in their physical objectivity. I'm not talking about dualism or anything like that. You see, and so people are the perfect mediating bridge between things and the forms because of the way we can participate in them. That's my proposal. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's interesting, John, if I can jump in. What, what you're saying is like at least a 400-year-old idea, if not more. This, this notion <laughs> of, um, no, the, the, one, the one particular point that you ended on, which is, which is I'm sure you know, that during the Renaissance, when the Neoplatonic Great Chain of Being gets rediscovered, the, the centrality of the human as the middle point yes. of that Great Chain yeah. of Being, this is an idea which yeah. goes back to the first century, but which really gets taken up. The, the Vitruvian man is the person who squares the yeah. circle of the form and the object, right? This, yeah. that, yes. that, that's, that yeah. it's in the human that's, that, that is both the divine and, and the worldly. Um, and, and the microcosm there. Uh, and that's, that's a very, it's a very, it's, it's a very cool idea. It's a, it's a cool, it's also cool to be able to bring back 400 year old ideas and put them back in a, in a language that's like, <laughs> like amenable to, to, to find them science, to yeah. find, refine them, yeah. um, to rediscover something. When you were speaking about that, that sense of identity, there's a story that comes to mind. Um, the, the first Hasidic master of my tradition, Shner Zaman of Liadi, the Alter Rebbe, the story is told that he's sitting with his granddaughter and his granddaughter, they're playing a game of like hide and seek of some sorts. And, and the granddaughter grabs onto his, onto his hand and says, is this Zeta? Is this grandpa? And he says, no, that's grandpa's wrist. And she grabs his beard and says, is this grandpa? He says, no, that's grandpa's beard. Grabs his shirt. Is this grandpa? No, it's grandpa's t-shirt. And, and, and she, she isn't able to pinpoint. And every time he just, he, you know, plays this game, he's this great metaphysician and logician. She's just a little girl and she's not able to, to best him. But then they, they finish their game. He gets up to leave. He's walking out of the room and she calls out. She says, Zayda, she calls out to him and he turns around and she says, ah, there's Zayda. And he says, yeah, you got it. Nah. It's, it's, it's the, yeah. and over, over here, there's two things going on. Cause one is what you're saying before that no, op, no part of the object is the whole thing, but the essence of the identity participates in all of them. And, mm -hmm. and, and then, and then when that whole, and what happens here is it's not just that he turns around with his full body. Cause we could say that's, that's grandpa's body, but it's the fact that he responds to her call, I think is more important. Yeah. He's yes. responding to, to, to him. It is, it is he, his essence that has been called by her and in him turning in that, in that, in that, what's the, what's the Greek term that, um, metanoia in the metanoia it's towards, a profound kind of noesis, by the way, right. a profound right. kind of noticing you turn to notice what you haven't seen before. And, and turn, turn to respond to that call. I think that happens yeah. where, where, where Moses is, is, is turning to the call that's coming to him. And we, in relation, we're turning to those calls that are coming to us. There, it's, it's a shame. The, the last point you mentioned about, about the other being, being real and not just being an object, being something which can be in response to us, be in dialogue with us, right? It's, it's able to be to, to responsible, to be able to respond to our calling to their being with our being. Um, I got, I got, a, I got a, a bunch of very nice comments after the first conversation that, that aired. Um, and someone said, it's a real shame that you guys didn't invoke more Levinas, Emmanuel Levinas, uh, another German philosopher, a Jewish philosopher who is French German, yeah. who is a, a colleague and a student at some point of Buber. Um, and, and his yeah. emphasis on the truth is the reason why I didn't bring him up is I just don't know enough Levinas to, to bring him up in conversation well. But his focus, the little that I do know, is the focus on the, the, the real presence of the other and the real demand that the other makes upon us. Levinas' famous line is that the face of the other says, Lo tirzach, thou shalt not kill. The, the, uh, from the Ten Commandments, that the that the full that the there's an infinity in the other, which which the self, the the I, can never fully grasp and comprehend the thou, um, and in that sense, I, where where it's it's unobjectifiable and it it must remain our our relation must remain one of participation. Yeah, Le and Levinas is uh, of course is the bridge weird to 
the bridge between the direct bridge between Buber and Derrida, hmm. Levinas, huge influence. And I, I, you know, so yes, Levinas has the face, but Le, Levinas also has the trace, right? So that every aspect of it, and the aspect, it, it's not a part, right? An aspect, the, the, every aspect is of the whole thing, right? right? And so, right? But hmm. every aspect is a trace of, right? And, 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 and so that, because and Levinas is also things. very right. concerned, at least the way I read him, and I also need to read him more deeply, but he's very concerned with the fact that, right, although we are confronting the other in the face, uh, right, we, we're, we're also facing a trace. We, 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 it's, it, the, the, pre, the, right, he, he, he starts the critique against the idea that, you know, we, 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 we can make the other person fully present, the, you know, that, that, that whole critique that, you know, also in Heidegger, right, Garrett Gar- Gar- gets it from Heidegger as well. The, I, that, 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 to use some of our earlier length, that if we if we concentrate too much on how things are presenting, then we are losing that they're always also withdrawing from it's us. Leading. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That, the, the speech and the silence that we've been talking about as metaphors for that, and, and so participation is always a way of saying this beautiful thing is a trace of beauty. It participates in it in that it is presencing it. But it also is withdrawing beyond it into whatever it is that makes anything beautiful, really beautiful or something like that. And I'm, I'm wondering, John, in both of you, if, if, if the word that, that we're looking for here that kind of caps, like somehow addresses all of it and brings them together without representing them or, or fading too much in the background is attunement. Is that what, like when, 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 mm. You mean the that way sense of participatory Heidegger, knowing, yeah, yeah, yeah that right. deep sense of attunement, right? Which again, you hear the you hear the tune, sound, right? Listening, right? Yet participating. There's something going on there. I think that's maybe maybe pointing to the way that we we know that or we enact that. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, uh, so. I mentioned the book earlier, and it's one of these magical little thin books that's had a profound influence on me, Bearing Witness to Epiphany by Rusin, R-U-S-S-O-N. And he, he, first of all, he talks about the musicality of intelligibility. And he brings like that, you know, that when you're looking at an object, it's like music. Like, a, like when you're really looking at an object, there's a pattern that's unfolding and there's a, there's a through line like we have in music, which distinguishes it from just random noise. Uh, and, and every note is somehow, you know, participating in all of the music, but it, it, it doesn't, compl- is, but it's also a trace of all of the music to use some of our language. And he says, that's what, so all of our intelligibility is a musicality. And then he talks about, you know, that there, there, that it, there's an, an ongoing epiphany. And, and then he, and, and so I want to bring in the attunement because you're attuning to it. And he talks about bearing witness to epiphany. And I thought, you know, you and I got, we need to talk about this in Dialogos, because, uh, right? Mm-hmm. Because this idea that attunement is, right, bearing witness. And I think about, you know, and again, the biblical injunction, it's one of the commandments, isn't it, Zevi, that you shall not bear false witness, right? The, yeah. you know, the idea of bearing witness. And then, right. It's one, and of, then, it's one of the Ten Commandments, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Good. And so you're bearing witness to epiphany. So you're not making the epiphany, right? And you're not talking about the epiphany. You're doing this other thing. And I think what, what I'm suggesting is bearing witness is this especially kind of caring, nurturing, noticing. Because obviously I have to be noticing it and orient. I have to be having all of these wordless thoughts, but I'm opening myself up more and more and more to that without, right, taking, without saying, oh, it's done because it's an epiphany. Right. It, it's it, it's always beyond that. And so what I'm trying to do with Heidegger's notion of attunement, right, is I'm trying I'm trying to get at like. Th- this other sense, this the sense of, like the connection is to Lebanon, this sense of bearing witness, this sense of that. I, I I'm, there's a responsibility to like to get to do what I would call like a reciprocal opening in my noticing yeah. that. 
I, I key bearing with like when you're bearing witness, like when you bear witness yeah. to an important event, what it, what's the function of like, why do we want people to bear witness when we're getting married? For, like what's going on there? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Like, we're, there's a ritual that's pointing to some deep function, some deep process. There's a transformation yeah. of people happening and, it, and we bear witness to it. We're, we're not just noticing it. We're doing this more profound metanoia. metanoia yeah. And yet, yeah. what is that doing? What is it doing? Like, ah, see? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, what's, the thi- what's, the, what's the thing that's undistinct that you're, that you're sensing, that you're, that you're hitting what? up against? What's the thing that's what, undistinct what? right now? What's undistinct is in, and this is a platonic way of putting it, in the framework of things and objects, it seems to be the most useless thing to bear witness. Mm. And yet mm. we regard it as one of the most profound things. It somehow wouldn't be real. I mean, I get it. There's legal functions, but that's not just it. And so for reasons that are obscure, deeply obscure to me, I, I've tried playing golf a couple of times in my life because uh, golf just mm. puts me into despair because it reminds me of how much I'm prone to failure. But like there's an event and I haven't had it, but I had something similar enough to it. And I've heard other people talk about it. You know what you never want to happen. You never want to have a hole in one and be all alone. Mm-hmm. Not because mm-hmm. people won't believe you because people know hole in ones are possible. They'll believe you when you had the hole in one. It's not that people won't believe you. It's just that, that if that event is unshared, something essential is missing from it. That's the bear. Yeah. Uh, I'm using that as an analogy for bearing witness to epiphany, where epiphany means yeah. that we're, we're witnessing a profound disclosure of a new reality. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's something very true for Buber there as well, where, where if your experience of our liebness, your experience of you, of the union with all of reality, there's no one else because there can be no one else in that space. If everything is one, that's, that's alone. That's not worth doing. If it's yeah. just you, yeah. and then, if there's yeah. that, if that's your mystical hall alone, and there's no one there to see it, then, 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 <laughs> Yes, um, that's good. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's helpful. That's sorry. I, I just want to just I appreciate totally. that. That helps me understand Buber more deeply now. Thank you. I want to I want to add I want to add something from the Hebrew, which I think you'll appreciate as well, um, about not bearing false witness. So one of the so one of the Ten Commandments, as you said, is the Hebrew is Leisisa Hashem Hashem Elikech Alashav. I think it's Hashem Elikech, or it could be it could be one of God's names. I have to look at the verse, but. The, the Hebrew is very, it's very interesting there because it's the way that people used to take testimony, give witness was with an oath and the oath was on the name of God. So the way that the right. verse is phrased is don't take God's name in vain. And the name of right. God that's used there is the tetragrammaton is, is yod and vav which is the name yeah. of the being. It's, it's that which is interpreted by later Jewish interpreters and mystics as was, is, and will be as one. Yeah. 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 It's, it, it is being, yeah. being, being, that's, that's what the name yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, the best translation in in English. So not taking, don't take the name of being in vain, that there is a, there is a conception of being that we have. Don't, don't speak untruth about being itself is to take God's name in vain. So if you say that reality is fundamentally objects that we're fundamentally objectifiable and usable and, and where means to an end, what you're doing is you're taking being and you're speaking it vainly. Uh You're speaking ah, vanity into being, ah, right? Ah, and ah. and uh, and the other thing there is that later in the prophets in Isaiah, Isaiah tells the people of Israel, "Atem edai no Hashem." The Lord says, "You are my witnesses," which is being saying, "You are the witness of being." It is upon you to speak being truthfully. It's upon you. Yeah. To, what we're doing here is yeah. that when we say that being is fundamentally participatory, is- we're trying to figure out how do we articulate being in the most honest way. We are witnessing being. We're witnessing. That, yeah. that that name of yes. God, which is being, and this is this is starts to bring it to the last conversation, I think, because I keep thinking about for some reason the phrase that Jesus said, "The meek shall inherit the earth," mm-hmm. right? In some sense, this kind of way that um, I think there's something about <laughs> there's a certain kind of bearing witness is in in what allows for the bearing of witness is precisely my, the poverty in which I bring the poverty of, in some sense, this kind of, this, um, maybe this is what Heidegger is getting at, the clearing or the thinning of being, right, that we are so akin to that allows being to come up in all of these different ways and to speak, that there's some, there's some way in which our vulnerability, our mortality, our, 
our uh, fatality, right, is the in some sense the opening, right? Because mm. this is I know I it's like the and I've often I really appreciate what you're saying, like in all the things that you're drawing together here, Zevi, about this, and maybe this is what what La Levinas was also bringing together here is this that this fundamental experience of ethos right it, the encounter of the face that like there's that if you really really get present to the face and, and i think he's he's in some sense he's speaking literally and symbolically at once right yeah. um you're you're looking at in some sense ethos itself the very the very place in the universe such that is thinned out enough to itself to to bear birth to a very very finite perspective on everything that is right in both its its limitation and its and its wholeness in its wholeness being not what's seen right that there's something about the human being an ethos right the ethical per se which brings allows something like intelligibility to become present as intelligible right that there's this there's yeah. a sense of this our Right. I, I keep thinking about this. Maybe this is where the in the that sense of finitude or fatality, right? And poorness and this bearing witness and what makes us able to be able the emptiness we bring that can bear and have something come, but yet that also inhabiting a wholeness at the same time and all these things drawing back. All those things are kind of coming together in in this dialogue for me that so, so, so Harmon, in, in, Harmon in his book on uh, object-related ontology, he, he, he does something similar uh, and he talks about Levinas and Derrida. And sort of like, you know, so when I, when I come before the face of an object, right, or especially human face, right, there's a sense in which the face like, like participates in the mind and the mind is just another word and we use another container object uh, term and we're misunderstanding, right? Uh, so, right, but he says, my sense of that within you that withdraws from me can only be realized by enacting how I am deeper than any concept I have of myself. That's the vulnerability. That's the fatality, right? That there, I am not, and to go back to the, I am radically not self-sufficient, even though the ego and our narratives keep pretending that we are, for, you know, for various adaptive reasons. But ultimately, I am not self-sufficient. I am always metaxu, in between emergence and emanation. Always, always, always beholden to them and bearing witness to them. Um, and so I think our vulnerability isn't just an affective state. Yeah. It is an ontological realization, Bingo. right? It's an ontological realization of the fact that we are not self-sufficient in a radical way that allows me to realize that in your face, although I come become you become present to me, that is not a self-sufficient presence. This is the this is the postmodern critique of presence as a kind of complete self-sufficiency of the thing. Right. And, and that's again where I think Levinas and Derrida are actually helpful. So that's how I would try and connect to what you just said. Uh, right. 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 I think there's a, I think there's, a, there's two self sufficiencies here. One of them is, is simply our, our yeah. vitality, uh, which yeah. we prefer yeah. to use over mortality and, and, and our, our sense that we're not, that we need each other for, to, yes. this to survive. Yeah. Yeah. That's one. Yeah. But the other, the other thing which I think you're probably pointing out to as well is that we're not, we're not even to ourselves. We're not fully disclosable, right? That's right. That, That's right. That the depth of our own identity is beyond our own grasps, and and to recognize so there's 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 a there's a survival, um, there's an existential vulnerability, but there's also an ontological vulnerability yeah, yeah, where, where yeah. we can't plumb the depths of, of our own selves, yeah, and, and, and and the the demand of that in the I thou relationship in encountering the other is to realize that the same way that we are inexhaustible even to ourselves so is the other inexhaustible um to 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 themselves and and how much more so to us and and the the exhaustibility of the other i think is a very strong ethical demand for levinus and i think that 
I mean, we're using a lot of big words here and a lot of, but I think, I think practically speaking, when, when yeah. we encounter the others in our lives, strangers, friends, acquaintances, recognizing that the same mystery that, that we hold and the same, and this, this is a cliche yeah. truth because, because it's truth to, to recognize that the same, the same depth of, of uncertainty and angst and wish and hope and, and, and passion and care. These are things that everyone else experiences and, and to really internalize it. I think that is the work of, of art. That's the work of music to, to evoke us that sensibility, that sensitivity yeah. to the otherness of the other um, and to not yeah. collapse them into, into us or to not collapse them into one homogenous other. Um, and I think that philosophy at its best is, 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 is I think can move us to have that same sensitivity. Yeah. Um, and yeah. on, on note of that sensitivity, I'm going to be sensitive of the time here because I know that I know that you guys need to move on. And with the last few minutes, maybe we'll just go around and do a final closing statement. Um, maybe if Guy, you'd like to begin. I don't know if I could talk. <laughs> I'm just having my whole... <laughs> every, every thought I'm having is linking into the other thoughts and they're canceling each other out into this kind of feeling of you know, feeling struck. I think I'm feeling quite struck by the, yeah, by the sense of like the ontological sense of vulnerability. I think this is, at least for me, is touching on, I've had this sense in, in ongoing now for a while, but this place where, you know, this difference between what, there's something about that happened in the I thou, right? In, encounter in that genuine relationship, right? Which has something to do with the difference between exposure and vulnerability. And I'm, I'm, hearing, I'm hearing the richness of our poverty that it gets enact, right? enacted, like the inexhaustibility of the other, right? That, 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 that if you put them in isolation, they're not inexhaustible, they'll fall apart in some sense, right? But like with, with the other, there's an, it, we draw out our inexhaustibility from each other, right? There's this kind of, I, I'm getting this, e, this, e, this deeper sense of not just ethics, but ethos, this, mm. you know, a, a, affording, affording a, a being to come into and be the being that it is, right? That sense of ethos, right? Uh, all, all these things are playing together, including why I've been, what I've been trying to articulate with circling and what I've been getting out of it in this, I would say, it's like you wrote a poem, I think it was last week that was trying to get at this sense about, it, it, it was, it was as if it was like a line that had to do with kind of like the, the, from the position of the moment, right. That is getting an opportunity to be, to, to, to become in my, in my being. Right. And it said something like, please, I beg you not to fall anonymously, right? Into your, please, like, I seek to be known fully by you because it's only with you, I, I, without you, I become anonymous, right? In this kind of ethical sense of like, of like, may I be a, a like, in some sense, a, a bearer, right? Have enough poverty such that as many moments as possible, don't fall anonymous, in my gaze, if you will. So all these things are just kind of coming together. I'm quite struck by this, this, um, we want to call it a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I love how you pulled, pulled witnessing back into that and, and yeah. exemplifying and all of the things that we've been, we've been talking about and witnessing and, and exemplifying, hopefully. John. So, uh, um, just first of all, the, yeah, the profound appreciation of the presencing uh, of the logos and notice again how we've got this inexhaustibleness but it's not coming it's not it's not it's not showing up chaotically it's showing up as intelligibility the musicality of intelligibility but but what's what I, I was i was provoked by two things in what we were talking about and maybe we can make move turn to those in an in the next discussion one was the last thing Zevi said about, you know, how we are deeply, right, uh, we are deeply insufficient within ourselves in a, in a profound way. And to me, I mean, that, that was Jung's great claim. He took Freud's realization that there's something outside of egoic consciousness 
And then he said, but it's much more profound than you realize, Freud. I mean, that's how, that's how I read Jung. And Jung, Jung said, you know, you, what people always forget and you always have to remember is that ultimately the unconscious is unconscious, right? Which is this, you have a participatory relationship to it. You do not, you can't fully presence it and yet you are in no way separable from it, right? And, and it's not, and again, we use these container metaphors, it's below me and I'm above it. And that's just the, the, the unconscious is woven in every moment of speech and thought. It's not down here and you're up there. Th those pictorial containment metaphors can be deeply misleading. Now, what, why I'm saying all of that is there is this debate between Uber and Young. And I'm wondering if Uber did not get Young properly. I think it's our, 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 what's it, our, oh, I, I've got a book, a really good book. I, I can't quite remember the author's name about the debate. And, you know, and I, I, it might be interesting to look at that precisely about um, this. Uh, and, and then, so, and then there's another person that's coming to mind, which is Spinoza, because Spinoza has this weird thing. He's got all these terms and he defines them all and they all flow nicely and because he's Spinoza. But he has this other thing, which he invokes and he never defines but he invoked, he calls it the face of the universe. And it, it, form, it performs important functions in his ontology and his metaphysics and in affording scantia intuitiva and the life of blessedness. And yet he leaves it out. And that's so odd. It's so odd for somebody like Spinoza to leave this central thing, not, both not only undefined, but undiscussed. He just invokes it and he invokes it and invokes it. And, and I want to. I want to know: Is there some like? Is there something about what we've been saying about the face and participation and deal that I, we could then take back and help me to understand what's going on there? So, there, what I want to, <laughs> I, 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 I'm hungry now to take this into, you know, you know, putting Buber and Jung into, and they had a historical debate, uh, and it, it's about God, so that seems very relevant. And then there isn't anything explicit that I know of between Buber and Spinoza, but there's something going on there that I'd also like to talk about. What is Spinoza talking about uh, when he's talking about the face of the universe and, and, and why, and, and how does that relate to his? Because his, right? Because I think that his notion of scantia intuitiva is properly what I would be, what I've been arguing for is this kind of participation, um, right? And so, I propose that we turn to those two topics in our next discussion. If you gentlemen want to continue the journey, yeah, I'm 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 for it. Then we 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 just we left off with a with a fantastic cliffhanger, and John has did it once again, where he has led us <laughs> right from one into the next. Yes. Um, okay. I, Jung, Buber, uh, Spinoza, all all characters, which I mean, I'm very into and. The audience yeah, the channel too. we've been we've been exposing them to as well. Um, yeah, I'm I'm just gonna I'm gonna take the opportunity to say thank you both to you, John, mm. and to Guy for, yeah. for for showing up so fully, um, and so and so graciously and so intelligibly and so kindly, um, and mm. and John for continuing to envision this project and continuing to to pull us forth in your momentum. Um, I just want to I just want to say that. There was there was a brief moment. I think it was the end of last uh, Zoom where the Zoom had ended, um, and like we were leaving one at a time, um, and it was either Guy or John. One of you had asked me um, how how I was, like Zevi, how are you? Um, and it was done so genuinely and so and, and meant so deeply. Um, and even though I didn't get the chance to, to respond and to, to, to return the question, which I felt <laughs> bad about later, but the very but to me, that genuine expression, that witnessing mm. to, to care and to the interconnectivity and the vulnerability yeah. between us, to me meant more than the two hour conversation uh, wow. that, that, that yeah. two seconds. Um, so so I want to I want to share my thanks to both of you for being so so present and so caring and so welcoming in this discussion with with your full beings. Um, and and I respond with that hopefully and and thank you guys so much for coming on well thank you i love being here i just love me being too here. me too